Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over seven years experience covering the industry and has talked to tens of thousands of drivers and gig workers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertain, and educate. So let's dive in. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Rideshare Guy podcast. And recently, I went on my friend Steve's podcast. He runs a podcast called Rideshare Rodeo. That's ridesharerodeo.com if you're interested in checking it out. And he also runs the site uberliftdrivers.com. And he's got a pretty popular podcast where he's been interviewing a bunch of gig economy workers, experts, people involved in building products and services for drivers and gig workers. And he recently asked me to come on and we had had a long, close to an hour discussion about sort of everything ranging from the future of rideshare to what's going on with the Uber and Lyft driver shortage and really everything in between. It was a great conversation and uh, I wanted to actually go ahead and replay that conversation to you today in case you're not already listening to his podcast. Well, first, if you're not, feel free to check out his podcast, Rideshare Rodeo. And then second, you know, the Uber and Lyft driver shortage has really been a big topic over the past month or two. We've fielded, I mean, honestly, not hundreds, but definitely dozens of media requests from big and small. I mean, I think as, you know, customers are really getting back out there and seeing, you know, taking Uber and Lyft rides again as things open and back up, they're sort of seeing Uber and Lyft prices at an all-time high and reliability at an all-time low. And so this has been a huge story in the media that we've been covering very closely, obviously talking to a number of drivers about what's going on here. And, you know, I even did an analyst call earlier today and a few consulting calls last week week about this very topic. So a lot of interest here. And one of the things that I, uh, Steve, you know, and I chatted about in this interview, we focused a lot on the Uber and Lyft driver shortage, how long it'll last, you know, even why there is one in the first place and also how it compares to delivery. Because uh, strangely enough, you know, delivery after some initial issues with supply, they've had very reliable service, you know, on food and grocery delivery for the last year or so. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Dara's recent controversial uh, tweets about a Washington Post article that talked all about the take rate that Uber takes from their drivers. So I'll uh, opine on my thoughts there. And uh, I did not agree with Dara's take. So that'll be interesting for you to hear. And I really, I, I like the, the part where Steve and I talked about how a lot of these companies, you know, these gig working companies, they tend to do a lot of analysis at an aggregate level, right? And I think sometimes that misses what drivers are seeing on the ground level. And I think this take rate discussion is the perfect example because basically, you know, Uber and Lyft are, or Uber specifically is saying that their take rate is actually going down. And I guarantee if you talk to drivers and ask drivers, they'll feel the exact opposite. So we'll talk about what exactly is going on here. Uh, we also talk about driver saturation. I think that's a always been a big concern for Uber and Lyft drivers, but how that might affect delivery drivers going into the future, a bit of rideshare versus delivery. And then I think we end the conversation talking about some new rideshare companies. So that's always uh, exciting. And there are a couple of interesting ones on the horizon. So I'll give my thoughts there. And I'm actually trying to get one of those new rideshare companies on the podcast. So you may be hearing from them here on the podcast very soon. Other than that, though, I think uh, if you do have any questions about this episode or anything else, you can always reach out to me on social media. Uh, send me an email, harry at the rideshareguy.com. And uh, as always, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out. All right, let's hit the road. So today we have uh, Harry Campbell from the Rideshare Guy. Um, very excited to have him on today and talk about this subject because I think that it does relate to everybody. I think that a lot of people are missing this subject at this time. Like, I think that they're not really, they're either just complaining or they're yeah. out, you know, they're out They're They're waiting till they go back to ride share. Or they're not going to go back to ride share or so many things. So today I want to talk to Terry about the future of ride share and how we come out of this pandemic. Um, it is pretty clear that the United States, at least, even though there's a lot of variants and other things going on that we are coming out of the pandemic. Um, yeah. I think we can all agree on that. I mean, things are opening here in Colorado. We've been open for a while. I know that you guys are just creeping up on a full open, right? 
Yeah, we're just, uh, I guess, fully, I'm not sure exactly what's going to change, to be honest, because I've sort of, you know, been living my life pretty much as normal since I got vaccinated a few months ago. But uh, yeah, definitely jealous of some of the other states that have been operating and, you know, sort of uh, business back to normal. But I'm, I'm excited for it. And yeah, like you mentioned, definitely, you know, we see huge, uh, where he's seeing a huge spike in demand from uh, customers on rideshare services. So obviously, they're ready to get out there and get back going. And I guess the question mark is whether the drivers are too. Right. And so, okay. So with that, when, so let's talk about just in a nutshell here, like 2010 to pre-pandemic, just right before. Okay. In a nutshell, 2010, the pre-pandemic, I mean, that's the last 10 years. <laughs> that's but, the uh, life, life of rideshare. I'll, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. I mean, really, I mean, <laughs> you know, luckily I was one of the, not the first Uber and Lyft drivers, you know, but I got started driving for Uber and Lyft about seven years ago, which in rideshare years is a hell of a long time. Most people don't last that long and, you know, don't even come close to lasting that long. I think uh, Uber released a stat that said two thirds of all drivers quit after just six months, just to put things in perspective. And so, Really, I think what you saw at the beginning was that this was new, this was sexy, consumers obviously loved Uber, and on the driver's side, you could really earn a lot of money. And I think this is actually typical, not just to Uber, but with new services in general, right? When they, you know, especially ones that are well-funded, right? When they're brand new, they obviously need to build, especially marketplace businesses, they need to build up that supply. And so they pay more, or they offer hourly bonuses, or the rates are higher. And so that's really what we saw at the beginning, is that driver Drivers could earn more. I remember going out and actually one of the first podcasts I did was um, uh, that's still listenable, although I don't know how relevant it is since it's seven years old, but uh, I talked about how I was earning $50 an hour driving on July 4th, and that was in Newport Beach, California. And really what we've seen over the years is I think rates have clearly come down. And I personally feel that the positives still outweigh the negatives across the entire gig economy. And I mean, probably not a shock because my whole Built business is built around that. You wouldn't be able to build a really successful business if you hated the gig economy and you know thought that it was the worst job in the world. But um, I do think a lot of those lingering issues, you know, the negatives parts, you know, do uh, are still around. And for some drivers, I think they're able to figure it out and make it work for them. And for others, I think that they're not able to figure it out, and that's why so many turn. So you know, in a nutshell, I think that's kind of the progression we've seen as you know rates kind of coming down, more positives and negatives. Um, but uh, you know, still for you know, there's millions of you know millions of people now working in the gig economy. So I guess what I would say at a high level, you know, it obviously can't be that bad if millions of people are doing it over many other jobs. Right. I've been, I've been driving out here for six years plus. All right. I mean, I haven't, I haven't drove during the pandemic. I didn't yeah. do it. Um, and I think that we talked a long time back and you know that I do a lot of production work too. So for me, rideshare isn't just supplemental mm -hmm. weekly income. It's more like if I go on the road with Shania Twain and do a European tour for six weeks and come yeah. back for three weeks, what do I do during those three weeks? Yeah. Because nobody would hire me right. and let me take six weeks off. <laughs> yeah. And I think actually that's really the perfect microcosm of the positive outweighing the negative, right? I mean, I think you, you know, obviously number one complaint from every driver and every gig worker is low rates. They don't make enough. And I, I have to say, I hate to break it to people. This is actually true across pretty much every job you're ever going to have. Everyone wants to get paid more. Everyone always thinks that they're not paid enough, not to, um, you know, sort of make light of that fact, but definitely, you know, that's a common, uh, you know, I guess you would say complaint and it's pretty big one in the gig economy. But at the same time, you know, that's why I'm such a fan of the gig economy, because regardless of the pay, there's literally no job in the planet that would allow you to do what you just described right there. Exactly. And I do other things too. And so for me to flex time it, and for me to be able to have that flex to make my own schedule. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I know my city, you know, your city. So in my city, I can pick up the Westward or whatever, see what's going on. And yeah, yeah, a lot of times in the past, I've had to accommodate my life, my son's life. You have kids too. Yep. I've had to accommodate our life around kind of missing a lot of stuff because yeah. to make money in this, you, I mean, I've been in the service industry for 25 years, bartending, yeah. all kinds of stuff. So, I mean, like, that's just kind of something that either people are meant to, they're either able to be in that industry or they're not. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people catch on with 
relating service industry to rideshare sometimes. Yeah, that's actually a really good point about the relation between service industry and rideshare. And I mean, it's really kind of what my whole business, you know, we've got a couple courses for drivers on rideshare and now delivery that we just launched. And, you know, that's really like a lot of the videos and a lot of the training that we do and even articles and, you know, everything they're releasing, you know, like dealing with passengers, a lot of this is de-escalation, right? Like we've seen a bunch of safety incidents in the past, um, you know, probably six months. And of course, you know, these are terrible. Like some of these are really bad, really scary. And I'm, you know, I'm here driving in LA, I'm 6'3", 200 pounds. Like there have been many times where I've picked up or dropped off people and been a little, you know, sort of sketched out like, Hey, this seems pretty shady. This seems pretty scary. So imagine if you're someone smaller or a female or, you know, so you can very easily see how some of these situations can be scary. But at the same time, you know, if you've worked in service industry, you understand, right? Like, Hey, you can, how to deescalate a situation, right? Like you don't want to drop someone off on the side of the road in the middle of a freeway. If you're going to kick a passenger out, you do it in a well-lit area. You do it in front of a police station. You know, there are deescalation strategies and training. And actually that, you know, like if you've worked in a big, you know, sort of like hotel chain in the service industry, like they do yeah. this type of training. And, you know, in the gig economy, you legally cannot get training from your employers because you are independent contractors. And so I think that's really, you know, I think that's kind of the crux and this is training specifically, but it sort of flows out to many other responsibilities that you have as a gig worker, whether you realize it or not, you kind of need to understand de-escalation training. You know, you need to understand your taxes, you need to understand your insurance and, you know, we can go on and on, but I think that's sometimes a challenge. And just to be frank, you know, like a lot of people get into the gig economy looking to make a couple hundred bucks a week, um, yet they now have all the reporting and sort of business requirements of an actual business owner. And I think that, you know, running a business is hard, so it's not for everyone. And I think, you know, it's, it's a little difficult sometimes to tell someone like, hey, you're not a good fit for this gig, but that really kind of is the reality and not all situations, but I would say some situations for sure. I'd I'd say most, almost all. <laughs> I mean, we yeah, got eighty-five I mean, percent of the gig economy wants to be flex. Yeah, only fifteen wants to be full time, and those who fight for the full time and the AB five type pro act type passages, mm -hmm. they it, it's always been very odd to me that they want to fight for minimum wage mm -hmm. and health benefits. Yeah, for a company they hate when they can walk out the door right now and have a job that starts this evening with those two things. Yeah. Well, and I think that's, you know, one thing I've always seen that I think is an interesting phenomenon is there's sort of this barbell effect when it comes to tenure of drivers, right? You have a lot of new drivers because the companies are always hiring, people are always quitting. And so they need a whole bunch of new drivers and you have a lot of veteran drivers. I mean, you know, it's funny yeah. when we do our annual survey, I mean, we have people that are, I just got an email from this guy named John. I won't share his last name, but I literally just read it. He's driving in Boston and he's like, oh, you know, I've got 15,000 rides. I've got all my strategies down. I'm earning $40 an hour. And I said, wow, this sounds great. Come write a guest post for me. And he said, you know, he already replied back to me. Right. So it's just sort of, you know, it's one email, one example. Right. But like, you do have a lot of people who figure it out and they figure out their strategies. And, you know, then I think you have some people in the middle, but it really does seem like, you know, if you can figure out the gig economy, you know, again, right. Like I'm not trying to hype up the gig economy and saying everyone needs to do it. And it's the most amazing job in the world. But uh, I do think it's pretty clear that if you can figure out this job, you know, it's better than a lot of other comparable jobs out there. I agree. And I think that, I mean, with one third of, uh, and this includes, we've had guests on, on the podcast who are not app based or on demand platform mm -hmm. gig workers, but they're true gig workers. We've yeah. had, you know, we had a nonprofit opera house in LA. Oh, cool. You are. Um, and, uh, you know, she's now shut down because of AB five. Hmm. Um, you know, yeah, well, so, the AB, but, yeah, you know, the AB five is sort of its own, uh, uh, its own mess. I don't know how much you want to get into it, but yeah, definitely. No, I, I that, don't. That I don't. Sort of no, where... I, I really we've touched on it a bunch. I'm just. <laughs> I know. Just I, pointing I think, out I think that I saw one third you, of you the workforce, few... yeah, is gig economy. You know, the, now definitely. it's not all app based. It's not all, yeah. but they seem to be coming together a little more. You, the, yeah, I mean, more and more app based stuff and. And it mm -hmm. does seem to be bringing all of these freelancers and gig economy type people together. And I think we're going to see more of that. 
Yeah. Well, I think that's actually a good point because I mean, really, when you think about the definition of the gig economy, for me, the gig economy actually is a lot more focused on app based work, right? It what enables that flexibility, that on demand onboarding, that on demand pay. I mean, what are the services where you can basically work almost whenever and wherever you want? And when you're done, cash out that pay instantly, right? A lot of the more traditional, you know, staffing jobs and some of these freelancing jobs are really nothing like that, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you right. are you kind of can pick some jobs here and there, but it's not like you can open an app and work whenever and wherever you want, right? I think of gig economy as much more technologically based, right? Usually through an app um, or a website, but you know, so companies, obviously Uber and Lyft, I think are in that category, food delivery, grocery delivery. And I think over the past year, what's really exploded are these last mile services, you know, a lot of which we've tried to feature recently on the podcast, just a couple on my podcast that we've talked about. Curry is an on-demand, it's kind of like an Uber for on-demand construction materials, right? Um, there's point pick up, right? Which is another one, right? So there's all these sort of like what I think of last mile um, delivery companies. And that seems to, you know, really have exploded. I mean, even like Amazon Flex, for example, you know, I think of that as gig economy, or it yeah, is definitely absolutely. gig economy, but you know, those types of driving jobs where you're selecting your shifts, using an app, you know, kind of working on demand and, you know, that kind of nature for sure. So freelancing, you know, is probably one level up, but encompasses, you know, more people. And that's kind of what you were talking about with AB5. I think it was actually targeted at gig economy and maybe even specifically, you know, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and Instacart and Postmates, but it affected a whole bunch of other freelancers, you know, which I don't think of as being in the traditional uh, gig economy, which, you know, to be fair, like they may have their own set of issues, but definitely it's a very different type of, um, you know, sort of job, I guess you would say. And also, you know, I would oh, say regulatory wise, you know, you want to apply probably pretty different rules. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and you can look at any one of the spectrums. I mean, like when I was doing the opera house, I looked at these and a lot of times these people are paid for four days worth of gigs. So that makes mm -hmm. it very rough for them. Yeah. So I'm not, I, I'm, we definitely base more on the app based gig economy as well. Mm -hmm. I just am kind of trying to speculate and look ahead because I think that we're going to see more and more freelance type jobs or apps or mm -hmm. things of that nature to get around things. No, I don't think the pro act is going to pass. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that whatever that takes, even if it comes down to a filibuster or whatever it might take it, I just don't think they have it. Um, it's definitely closer than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. um, I'm surprised that they use AB five as their model. And I, you yeah. know, I won't tread on this too long. I just think we're going to see some merging of the traditional gig economy yeah. So I think if you look at, yeah, I think if you look at a lot of the sort of, you know, more futuristic surveys and studies that have been done, you know, by the think tanks to get paid millions of dollars to sort of ideate in the sky, they typically say, you know, okay, the, you know, this percentage of the economy is shifting to freelance, like everything's going to freelance, everything's going to gig economy. And I think that there's some truth behind that for sure. I'm not, I don't know, you know, talking about the future of rideshare and the gig economy, you know, I don't think we're that close, you know, in the next five or 10 years you know, lawyers, doctors, everyone's going to be using no, an app no, no, to get no. their next job or their next right. work. You know, <laughs> I, I don't, I really don't think we're that close to no, that, no, you know, no, in the no. next five, 10, or even 20 years. But I do think that, you know, understanding, right. Like the benefits of you know, employers hiring independent contractors versus employees and how that benefits the companies. I mean, that's kind of what we saw in California with some delivery companies, uh, or sorry, some, you know, uh, what do you call them? Grocery uh, chains, for example, you know, kind of outsourcing now to independent contractors instead of employees once, uh, you know, sort of Prop 22 and things like that pass. I mean, basically, it's just the gist is that, you know, I think it's a lot cheaper for companies to hire independent contractors and, you know, sort of, I think more benefits accrue to the employers. And so I do think we are going to see sort of a slow to medium uh, kind of shifting towards that type of uh, employment. Yeah, I, I actually fully agree with all of that. So I'm, I'm looking here at my notes on. Uh, okay, so you mentioned coming when we first started about the passengers are coming back, the drivers are. I think mm -hmm. we all know that the pandemic aid is playing a role in that. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, safety, um, even though most are vaccinated and whatnot, I think that mask being mask police is still a big issue. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I talk to drivers all the time and they, 
are still having masking issues and like you were saying de-escalating yeah. like dude that that can I mean, turn into a fight very quickly right well especially with mask which has been kind of politicized you know in the first place and then now you have a lot of people who are vaccinated and still being required to wear a mask and so you can kind of imagine that you get into this really big gray area where now it's kind of on drivers to enforce this policy which maybe scientifically you know doesn't make a whole lot of sense you know why you know if i'm a passenger i would it's not hard for me to argue okay i get this as policy but you know i'm vaccinated why do i have to wear a mask here's my vaccination card right and if a driver really wants to follow the rules then they kind of need to tell them to wear a mask but so you know it's a it's a tricky situation right which you know drivers probably would say they're not paid enough to handle and that's you know i think like you said i mean for as far as why drivers aren't coming back i think it's pretty obvious that, you know, unemployment, PPP, um, ERC, you know, employee retention credit, which we've talked about, that's a lesser known one, is having a big impact on drivers right now. I mean, there was an article by the Washington Post that said, Uber drivers, specifically Uber drivers, were the number one recipient of idle grants, these $1,000 grants. You know, out of all the people that received $1,000 idle grants, the most popular profession was Uber driver, just to put things in perspective. And I, I feel in small part, we may have contributed to that because I think we had a video that had like three or 400,000 views on how to <laughs> claim this, you know, one thing. It was basically $1,000 of free money. So I think that's the number one reason. And then, like you said, there are some secondary reasons. I think, I think probably the second biggest reason, though, is that a lot of people have switched over to delivery, you know, either because at the beginning oh, yeah. of pandemic, they, um, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, rideshare demand went off the cliff. There were no rides for anyone. There was COVID issues, in, right? Like in you one said. day. In one day, right? And in so a day, lot literally. of folks yeah. switched over to delivery. The delivery companies, I mean, DoorDash is a $50 billion company right now. I just interviewed the president of their company. And I mean, it's pretty amazing the stats that he was listing off, you know, two and a half, I think, billion dollars they paid their dashers last year. They've got 2 million dashers right now. So delivery companies are like real competitors to Uber and Lyft now at the end of the pandemic. Whereas before, I don't think you could even put DoorDash in the same class or category as an Uber or even even a lift. So I think, you know, you've got more competition, more people moving over to delivery. And then some of those secondary reasons would be things like COVID safety, or, you know, it's just, yeah. um, you know, like uh, having to enforce that, or even like, I've seen a lot of these, you know, for whatever reason, over the past six months or so viral videos of drivers being attacked by passengers or having to deal with it. So yeah. I feel like there's definitely some smaller or more secondary reasons, but those would be the two big ones in my opinion. Yeah. Um, well, as you know, um, I work with the guys at Para, so I did watch yeah. the DoorDash video because I was oh, okay, very cool. interested to see <laughs> how he how he was going to state that. I, I think you were doing a great job at picking his brain. I, I think he tried to, you know, do his best, but I think that it's important for everybody listening to understand that what do we all want as drivers and gig workers? Yeah. We want we we want good money. We want to make good money. So what do these companies want? Good money. Now yeah. we all call them the rich. And, uh, you know, the elites and they take too much, but it's, we're really all doing the same thing. We just want more money. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think, what were you saying? Ahead. No, I think that that's a good point. It's something that I try to instill in a lot of people is that, you know, in general, right, you see these stories, oh, you know, some guy worked for this company for 10, 20 years, and then gets laid off. Like that happens when you're an employee. And when you've been really loyal in the gig economy, it's like that times 10, right? Like there's no loyalty on either side of the equation, to be frank. Drivers are driving for whoever, you know, will pay them the most at the time. And companies, I think, sort of think, you know, basically the opposite, right? They're trying to get workers for as cheap as possible. So if you understand that, right, like the way I I tell drivers and gig workers is no one cares more about your money. No one cares more about your job than you do, right? It doesn't mean you have to do everything you can to screw over the company you're working for, but just understand at the end of the day, right? Like they don't always have your best interest at heart, right? There are certain actions or things that they may ask you to do that are not in your best interest. And it's not that you need to say no every single time, but you need to understand that, right? So if a trip comes in, and they're sending you trips, that trip isn't necessarily the best trip for you to take in that moment at that time. And according to even your schedule, your personal schedule or what you have, what your goals are for that day. Right. So as long as you understand that, then you can make more informed uh, decisions. And I think that if you really kind of take that principle and then apply it to many different areas of 
work life as a gig worker, you can have a lot more success than just sort of, you know, kind of assuming that everyone is on the same team and everyone has the same incentives, because frankly, right. you know, I'm not trying to sound gloom and doom, right. But just the incentives aren't quite aligned at all times. Right. And I mean, like if you, when you talk about delivery, look at all the delivery platforms, you can name any one of them, Grubhub, yeah. Eats, DoorDash, any of them pre-pandemic, they were yeah. all doing horribly. Yeah. And drivers, or at least drivers, delivery well, drivers that I talked to were doing just horribly in most yeah. markets. I guess I would say push back that it depends on your definition of horribly, right? I think that a lot of people have got it into your into their head that okay, like you said, right? Like all of these gig companies are, you know, rich and making billions and all that. And there's definitely, you know, a certain Per, not percentage, but there's certain, I guess you would say like people or groups involved with these companies that are doing very well, you know, early investors, probably early employees and probably even current employees. But, you know, that's why it's interesting to think about like the companies themselves are not profitable, right? It's no. not like, you know, Uber, people obviously love to complain about the take rate of Uber, you know, on rides and the take rate, you know, restaurants obviously feel that Postmates and DoorDash take way too much money. Drivers feel that they're not making enough. And so when you think about it on that, you you know, what they would call a unit economics basis, right? Like the companies aren't profitable basically, right? That doesn't mean that they're not rich and that, they, you know, a lot of people haven't oh, yeah. made billions of dollars, but I think it's just important to understand that because, you know, it really gets at the heart of the equation, right? If Uber is taking 30% of every single trip, there's a reason for that. It's not necessarily because they're greedy. It's because insurance is really damn expensive. You know, <laughs> the marketing is really expensive. Hiring all the drivers, you know, that have quit, and paying them new bonuses, right? Or sign on or whatever it might be is expensive. And some of these are more self-inflicted wounds than others, and they could do a better job, right? And so it's easy for maybe for them to say, oh, it's so expensive for this, but that's because they did a crappy job at, you know, something else. But I do think it is just sort of, you know, important to balance that. And I think that's kind of what, um, you know, I was trying to get at in some of these interviews with my exec, uh, like the executives, like the DoorDash president, for example, yeah. because at an individual driver level, I don't think about any of that crap, right? I just want the best trip that's the best for me in the moment. And I totally get that. And that's kind of how I am the exact same way too. Uh, you know, in the moment, I want to maximize my income, but it's really tough. And I'm not saying that drivers even need to worry about it. I think the companies need to do a better job figuring this out. Like, how do you connect what's happening on an individual level with the fact that like, if we all only take the best rides and best deliveries, then the customers start to start getting screwed and then they start using the services less. And, you know, I think that's where the, a lot of these gig companies have really struggled figuring out that balance. It's like they either give too much or they take too much, right? And like, if obviously if the companies have all the power, then they kind of tilt it more towards their side. And I think that's typically what we've seen is it usually things kind of work out in the favor of the companies over the years. Yeah, I, I think that I think you're right. I think that one, obviously, six plus years in rideshare, um, I've seen all the dips. I saw it go yeah. from my straight split, you know, and here in Denver, when they first came around, um, I went with Lyft first. I don't know why. I think a friend signed me up. Mm -hmm. um, but I went with Lyft first and it was like 85 15. It was like the best yeah. percentage I've ever seen. And then it went to 80 20. Mm -hmm. When I got onto Uber shortly after, it was 80 20. Mm -hmm. Then we saw the different things that have happened, but when they finally got down to being transparent with receipts through the app a few years back here in Denver anyway, and I know this from other markets too, but here in Denver, especially things were so dynamically priced for what Uber was taking. It was amazing. Yeah. You know, it's like, I know I'm supposed to just base it on here's my miles, here's my time, this, that, yeah. the other, don't worry about the rest. Is there a surge? That's all you can know. Yeah. But now I wanted to see the receipt. So when you see the receipt and you look at them back to back and you're like, you know, 28, 30%, 62%, yeah. 22%, 58. I think that was one of the most annoying times yeah. in the ride share game for me, because I was like, this is ridiculous. Yeah. Well, and I think that's a perfect example of where the companies really struggle. I mean, so Dara, I don't know if you responded to my 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 thread the other day, but Dara released this tweet storm the other day um, talking about the take rate that um, they've been taking from drivers because there was a Washington Post article that basically said, you know, because what the passenger pays is uncoupled from what the driver gets, right? A driver on a surge ride might get a $25 base plus only a $5 flat rate surge now in every market in the US, right? But the 
passenger might pay a hundred dollars for that trip. So that trip is going to be, you know, one of those 70% take rates. And what Dara was basically replying and saying is that I looked at the numbers on average, you know, our take rate has actually gone down over the past quarter. And this is, you know, according to him, and I don't think he has any real reason to lie, but I think it kind of highlights like Uber is basically saying right now, that they're actually that percentage that they take on average from drivers is going down. But if you ask drivers, they would say the exact opposite, right? They would say, oh, Uber takes 60%, Uber takes 50%. Their take rate has gone up over the years. And frankly, we really don't know, right? Um, We've done this analysis a few times in the past and their take rate has kind of hovered always in that 30 to 40% range when you account for their commission and the service fee, right? Because the service fee is now up to $3, right? So if, if you kind of look at it like from just pure math, right? Like on a 10 dollar ride that the passenger pays they take a three dollar service fee off the top that leaves with seven dollars and in kind of a traditional 75 25 split i'm simplifying here but this is the gist of right, how right. the math works you know the driver gets 75 percent of that seven dollars which i'm totally have no idea what it is but five dollars let's say you know something of that order and then you know on that trip Uber's take rate, which, you know, is going to be so on a shorter trip, right? Their take rate is close to 50%, right? And so there are trips where their take rate is really high. And it's very easy for drivers to sort of only focus on those, right? They don't look at the trips where Uber loses money or the take rate is a lot lower. And again, like I totally emphasize with that, I wouldn't blame them at all. I would probably do the same thing, but I feel like, again, the companies, you know, don't do the greatest job connecting or, you know, being transparent with that information. And, you know, typically if they're not transparent with their, that information, information that should be telling you something. It means they probably, you know, the information isn't good. They're probably taking, you know, a lot more, right? Like, you know, the fact that Dara went and reviewed all this data and now he's tweeting about it instead of sharing it in the past or giving it to this Washington Post reporter. I don't know. It like seems a little, little fishy to me, you know, I'm not like a conspiracy theory, but you know, it's, there was it's one sort of, part of that, of that tweet. In fact, where he said, I can't remember specifically what it said, but it was something alluding to I'm going to have to go ask about that. Yeah. (laughs) And in my head, I'm thinking, you know, maybe for exact specific numbers, but did you have, you know, yeah, what's going on? You didn't need to go. I I thought that was really kind of actually a little rude to even put in that tweet (laughs) to drivers anyway, that see that because it was like, dude, that's an extra slap. I mean, yeah, you know, I don't know. Yeah. No, I think we all I'm, know I'm that sure. he, he, I mean, if he didn't understand it, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be in the position he's in. <laughs> well, I will say, yeah, well, I, I think he, he would and he wouldn't, right? Because you imagine, right? Like, and, and that's actually, you know, I've interviewed Dara twice now. And I will say the right. first time I interviewed him was at a driver event in person in LA. Obviously, this must have been before the pandemic. And, you know, I will say, like, we got into some, you know, because I sort of knew, like, okay, obviously, I got to ask this guy about, you know, why, why don't they pay drivers enough? And, you know, kind of go down that rabbit hole, of course, right? In my first interview with him. And I will say, I was impressed at just how much level of details he did did know in that first interview, like you think about it, like this guy's the CEO of a 70, $80 billion company. Drivers are one piece. Riders are one piece. Uber Eats is another piece. Like there's a lot going on. I would imagine I've never been CEO of a company like Uber, but I imagine there's a lot going on. And I was impressed, um, in that first interview with him by the level of detail he did know, and maybe he was prepped for the interview, maybe he wasn't, but um, I will say that I was like, oh, you know, I'm kind of surprised that he knows this level of detail. And I actually, you know, in this recent tweet storm, I kind of felt the opposite. I felt that he didn't know um, that much level of detail because the way, you know, what the Washington Post article was describing was that flat rate surge that I just explained, right? right? Like that you are probably yeah. familiar with and where why it's very confusing was you know, I won't go into the whole history, but basically in California, they got rid of it after AB5 passed to make it seem more in California only make it seem like drivers are more independent, which was probably a smart thing to do because it does actually, you know, make, you know, connect things more. And then once Prop 22 passed, they brought it back. <laughs> and so, right, um, yeah. you know, it like, frankly, I think the timeline is confusing and how it works is also very confusing. And that was kind of one of the things I tweeted out, like, Hey, if the CEO of Uber can't even understand how drivers are paid on an individual versus aggregate level, like imagine what your average driver is thinking. And that's again, why, you know, with some of these issues, I do think it's important to highlight like, Hey, what are the downsides of abusing this feature or doing that? But I also 100% think that it's on the responsibility of these companies to figure out how best to, 
um, sort of communicate that to drivers or to sort of ensure that they're following the rules and not uh, abusing. I don't think it's on the driver's side, but hey, it is. it might be interesting for people to know. Yeah, I just think they're going to, I mean, something's going to have to change to bring the me's back. The people like me and the veteran drivers who yeah. even have been through all the, the highs and lows because we've seen flat rate turn to multiplier, turn to flat rate to yeah. multiplier back and forth, which always been, has been an indicator to me because I've been able to watch that when, when, when they did multiplier and went to flat rate, but then they went back. It always was at a time when there was less drivers. Yeah. Hmm. Here in Denver, anyway, in our market, multiplier would come back when the drivership was down. Hmm. And I always thought that was a little odd because we all, we all love the multiplier. Yeah. Well, and I think that definitely, you know, I'll be honest, like the use <laughs> the Stevens that are the veteran drivers and, you know, maybe even the me's, although I'm not really driving that much these days, I did go out for a three for hundred dollar bonus. It was a little too good to pass up recently. So thank you, yeah. uh, Dara and Uber for that quick hundred <laughs> bucks. But, um, I think the veteran drivers frankly, aren't coming back. I don't know that there's much Uber and Lyft can do to get those veteran drivers back because for two reasons, I think number one, if you've sort of seen higher pay, if you've seen a better system, you've sort of seen the light, right? You know what it's like to drive with six destination filters before they dropped it down to two or to drive with higher rates or, you know, all of the things that have been changed, you know, the, the multiplier versus flat rate surge versus a brand new driver who's coming onto the system. They don't know what it used to be like. Right. And so right. I think that that's a challenge there. And actually a good example of this would be what we saw in New York city. So they instituted the, a yeah. uh, minimum wage in New York city for drivers that ended up, they released data in New York City from the TLC because it's a highly regulated UberX market and drivers are making way more money because they did a pretty smart uh, minimum wage based off utilization, right? So drivers kind of have to stay busy. But what that means is that the companies and the drivers utilization, right? That utilization rate is now incentivized, right? You can't go out and sit there and not get any trips because Uber is going to have to pay you, <laughs> you know, a minimum wage, right? And so what they do is they have sort of a semi-scheduling. You have to drive in certain times in certain places. You still get a select blocks and there's some flexibility. Yep. It's actually very similar to how DoorDash works, for example, with their scheduling shifts. And, um, you know, frankly, like drivers freaking hated this. They did not like scheduling shifts. They did not like scheduling blocks, even though it was sort of awarded, you know, priority was awarded to the best, the most loyal, the highest rated drivers, which kind of yep. makes sense. <laughs> you know, which, like, does, obviously, which makes sense. It just left a lot of people out. Right. But, you know, obviously, if you're an employer, but, I mean, you're not that's, how, give, like, but that's how it is. I mean, right. That's... You're not going to give the shittiest workers, you know, the most unreliable workers, the best <laughs> shifts, right? Like, duh. Right. Well, um, but why it was so interesting to me is because DoorDash has been like that since day one. Seven years ago, when I did my first dash in Orange County, it was a Raising Cane's fried chicken place. You know, I had to schedule my shift. And you don't really hear drivers complain about those scheduled shifts like you did with this outrage with Uber and Lyft because it was new, right? Because they were used to this old system, right? And so you can kind of see that like, hey, I think that system could work. It still provides for some flexibility. Um, but, you know, you, you know, because you really don't need the ability to log on whenever and wherever you want. You know, you're not going to go do one trip and then log off, right? There's certain <laughs> flexibility that you could lose and you wouldn't actually mind, right? But you sort of, it does matter, Um you know, whether you got that in the first place or not. And I think that's another thing I'm, I'm sort of, man, I, I hope I uh, get paid by this interview from Uber and Lyft and all these gig economy companies. I'm giving them a lot of good advice, but you know, that's the <laughs> other thing that I feel like they've really missed out on and they don't understand, right? Cause they're doing all these AB tests and, you know, like the perfect example, um, which relates to the DoorDash interview. And, you know, I think we wanted to talk about this, but, you know, uh, Uber, for example, they gave drivers in California, the ability to see destination and they gave drivers the ability to um, you know, see the fare and some other details. like, um, And they didn't realize that some drivers would abuse this. Like, I, I literally was like, oh my God, how dumb can you guys be? Like, of course, some drivers are going to sit there and decline 99 trips until they get you know, that one trip that they want, right? They could have put like some basic guardrails in place, you know, like, hey, what they end and what they ended up settling on, I actually think makes a lot of sense. Like you can see the last five or you can see the destination as long as you've accepted five out of the last 10 trips. Like, 
okay, you could argue over that number, but it's at least reasonable. Well, I think that's that, fair. I mean, if you're yeah. not accepting five out of 10, you're not, I know. you're, like, you're, you're not just even that. Picking. You're just cherry picking <laughs> right. from your couch. You're not even just right. cherry picking. It's not even that high of a bar, but the fact that they released the feature, you know, like a free for all at the start, a bunch of people abused it. Like, duh, obviously that was going to happen. How did they not? They, they've done so many releases like this where like people end up abusing it. And then when they go back to five out of 10, now all the drivers are pissed at them. And so if they would have just originally launched, you know, something in the nature of five out of 10, you know, I think it would have been a much smarter experiment, if that makes sense. And that's kind of what, you know, gets rid of like some of those veteran drivers or gets rid of those other people that I just feel like um, they're not, they're not quite seeing. And it's kind of, I think it's kind of interesting for me because I've been doing this for seven years. So I could point to like six different examples of that they've done like this over seven years. But a lot of the people oh, yeah. working at these companies are not there for more than two or maybe four years because they get stock vested over four years usually. Um, so a lot of them aren't there for longer than one, two, three, four, even four years. And so I feel like like, uh, what's that famous saying? Those who uh, do not remember history are doomed to repeat it. And that definitely <laughs> uh, seems to be happening here. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I do know a lot of rideshare drivers who pivoted to delivery. Yeah. Um, right. End of April or end of March, start of April last year, like almost definitely. to that day when it was, when it went dead, they were yeah. just like, okay, well, I'm not going to be fully done. I'm just going to go over to delivery. I know a lot of them are happy, right? And have been happy for the year. I mean, that that was able to happen and that it blew up so big, the delivery mm -hmm. space. But I know a, a good handful of them that kind of, I know some that don't, but I know a good handful that miss the um, the people, yeah. believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. And uh, would actually like to see, you know, be able to go back to rideshare, but they're still not there. I mean, and I yeah. think that, I think that, with everything reopening, I think delivery is going to do great, especially compared to how it's always done or mm -hmm. did pre pandemic, you know, I mean, maybe it'd be a slight decline, but I think people are going to, they're enjoying it. Now they're in the groove of using it. Just like when Uber and Lyft came around, mm -hmm. it took a while, took yeah. a few minutes for people to get on board with that, but I think they're on board, but I think that there's going to be an oversaturation of delivery drivers. I think we're going to see yeah. some percentage of that be, be lopped off a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it's, you know, we can definitely might, might uh, cause a, a reback pivot to yeah. rideshare, but people are going to want that. Why, why should I go back to rideshare? These are the, the people I'm talking about specifically. I talk to people all the time, mm -hmm. but who do gig work, but I mean, like I'm talking about specifically the ride, the drivers I'd want. Yeah. So like the, the best out there. Yeah. Well, so there's never been a lot of crossover between rideshare and delivery. And that's sort of always been something that's surprised me. I think that a lot of people either get into rideshare or they get in delivery or they try one and switch to the other, or they try rideshare and switch to delivery. And there aren't a lot of people who are like, I go out and drive Uber and you know, uh, DoorDash, for example. And that's kind of like my thing, you know, so we found like in our surveys that maybe 10 to 20% of drivers are kind of like dual apping in that delivery and rideshare space. And even then, you know, some of them might like occasionally turn on Uber Eats and there are some good strategies. You know, if you're an Uber driver, you flip on Uber Eats. If you happen, you know, at the end of your shift, if you happen to be near the uh, destination that, you know, like your house, for example, because you're never going to get, you know, a 12, well, never, never, but you know, you might most likely will not get a 25 mile, you know, uh, food delivery order, right? It's going to be in a smaller radius. So it's sort of like a mini destination filter. So there's some good strategies that you can use between rideshare and delivery, but there's actually, you know, to be a delivery driver, there's much fewer requirements, right? Your vehicle is a number one tool as a driver, and you can basically drive with any old piece of shit on delivery, right? It could be a bike, it could be a scooter, oh. you could walk, you know, you could drive with a friend, a family member. Like I do, I started doing Instacart during uh, the pandemic and also because I have two kids and I'm lazy, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I'd be surprised, like maybe 10% of people drop off, 10 to 20% of people drop off with someone else, you know, like they go and shop with someone else and then drop off with someone else. And I see the same phenomenon on food delivery, maybe a little bit less, but, you know, like five to 15% of people do it as a team with a partner, a spouse, uh, you know, girlfriend, whoever kids that, you know, I've even seen kids, whoever it may be. So, um, you know, on the delivery side, there's just a lot less requirements. So I think they have a bigger potential pool of applicants. And I think that's been emphasized during the pandemic, you know, Instacart, DoorDash have announced that they've hired hundreds of thousands of drivers 
you know, DoorDash, uh, the president in my interview with him, interview with him, he cited that they have 2 million dashers on the platform right now. Like that, those are like Uber like numbers. Right. And if you think about it, like these delivery services have been, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, when demand was crazy, they were struggling and Instacart was, you know, one to two days or, you know, whatever it might be. But within a few months, they really figured out their supply issues pretty quickly. They hired enough drivers, you know, even as demand was spiking. And I saw, I was listening to a, uh, one of the earnings calls that DoorDash um, CEO Tony Hsu did. And that's exactly what he said is that, you know, early on we had some issues and then we figured it out. And I started thinking about it like, wow, food delivery companies have really not had that same supply and labor shortage. Like I order a delivery all the time, you know, for the reasons I mentioned, and because it's sort of my job to investigate a lot of these services and like, the food delivery companies have been very reliable compared to oh, yeah. Uber and Lyft. I've been calling rides all the time on Uber and Lyft over the past year, and it's been like the crappiest service you you know as many people have noted. But food delivery, so you know, there's there's, there's some differences in the kind of labor pool um, and the requirements too. Yeah, uh, I agree. I uh, I just wonder once that saturation and people start because I mean like. I mean, what we're talking about today, where does ride share go? I mean, yeah. to be honest, it's, you know, it's, what are, are they going to go back to the model of just bring, just onboard everybody and just keep them coming in. If they're here for a week, they're only yeah. here for a week because they've ran through quite a bit of the population. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so good point. And I would say two, two part answer. I think number one, I, I kind of early on in my, and you've been doing this for six years too. I'm curious if you have, have changed your tune because early on when I, in my career, you know, in the first few years of blogging at the rideshare guy, that was kind of my line is like, you know, they can only do this for so long before they burn the bridges or before they start going through all the workforce. And I think at a certain point, like in my second, third or fourth year of covering the industry, I decided like, holy moly, I was completely wrong on this, or at least in my opinion, I was wrong. Like, I think there's just so many potential workers out there. There's so many people, 300 plus million in the United States, right? That like, I don't know if they're ever, you know, going to burn through their bridges and that they ever kind of like tap out that market. And I think, you know, right now, like thinking about it right now most people i think are not coming back to ride hail because of unemployment that's a temporary situation that, there are other reasons big thing. that we've talked about right but that's i think one of the if not the main one so i feel i feel like this is actually a temporary uh blip for rideshare in the next three to four months as unemployment starts to wane i think about 20 to 25 mainly republican uh, states have stopped accepting additional unemployment so you know in those states which are frankly not the bigger markets for Uber and Lyft. So I don't know how much of it, but you know, you can sort of see the trend is going that way. I think that uh, Uber and Lyft supply issues will sort of resolve themselves on their own in the next three to four months. And we will see that, you know, people are going to be coming back to ride hail. And I do think on the delivery side, I think it might even be a little more extreme. I'm not as convinced that the value proposition on the customer side is like as amazing as it is on Uber and Lyft, right? Like on Uber and Lyft as a customer, it's like, wow, I want to go get blasted with my friends tonight. I call, you know, a tap ride and I go there and I don't get a DUI or none of my friends want to drive, right? Like the solution to the problem there is so much better than in food delivery where like, hey, I can cook my own food. I can buy groceries. I can go <laughs> pick up my own food. I can not eat tonight, right? Like there's so many, you know, the problem you know, or the solution with food delivery to the problem is not as meaningful. And that's sort of why I've always felt strongly that like as a driver, and I think the data pretty clearly backs this up, you know, especially in the surveys we've done, like rideshare drivers typically earn on average 15 to $20 an hour before expenses. Um, whereas food delivery before the pandemic was more in the 10 to $15 an hour range before expenses. And the expenses are probably a little less because you can drive, you know, any old car, right? So it doesn't have to be a nicer or newer car. Car. Um, you can use a scooter, a motorcycle, et cetera. And the miles you put on your car are definitely going to be less as not, not a crazy amount, but they will be less, you know, as a food delivery versus rideshare. But I think the pandemic has kind of messed with that, obviously. And I think right now, you know, or 
we don't need to go through the whole history of the earnings, but I would say like going forward, I do think we're going to return to a state where rideshare drivers is kind of like rideshare driving is the clear, or if not clear, like definitely most people realize that you can make more money driving for Uber and Lyft than you can doing food delivery. And I think right now that is the case. I just don't know if it's as clear, right? Or people have maybe gotten used to doing delivery driving. And so they're like, oh yeah, I could probably make a few bucks more with Uber, but you know, I'm going to just stick with delivery. I feel like it's just going to be that transition is going to be a little slower than the rideshare companies want it to be. Well, I think when the pandemic aid ends, um, I would hope I mean, I would, th- to me anyway, that's a perfect time for Uber and Lyft to, even if it's not something monumental, huge, that's a time for them to put a campaign together, do a little, do a little bump for driver pay. Yeah. I mean, right before there anyway, you know, right. As people understand PUA is ending. Yeah. And, you know, it might, I don't know. I mean, I know they work like this and it, it seems like it'd be a really good chance for them to bring some people back. Cause, um, you know, that's another thing is canceled rides. I keep hearing about yeah. that new drivers just, I mean, it's like, it's so hard to get a ride and here in yeah. Denver, we do pretty good earnings. Cause not a lot of, we have a good demographic between 25 and 35 mm-hmm. and not a lot of them own cars, oddly, Yeah, you know, they just rely on transportation and, and a lot of them make a six figure income out here. Yeah. So, well, and the canceled ride thing is actually interesting because, you know, so like I, like I said, I've actually been calling a ride every weekday because we've had a, a nanny come over to watch my son and she stopped taking the bus. And so, you know, she needed an Uber. So it's, I've like experienced it firsthand from the passenger side. And then of course, I've also seen it from the driver's side, from doing it myself and, you know, talking to so many drivers. But I think that the canceled ride is actually a good example where, you know, on the passenger side, like they see drivers are canceling all the time. Like, why is that happening? Okay. I'm a driver. I'm used to getting, you know, three to five minute ETA pickups in Los Angeles. And now I'm getting them, you know, because there aren't as many drivers. Um, you know, there's lots of passengers I'm getting 10 to 15 minutes out. Right. Like I don't, you know, maybe there's some, uh, you know, you sort of do get paid for that time now in some places, but for the most part, you don't get a lot of money. Let's, let's call it, um, just to keep the discussion simple. You don't really get paid for driving much for driving to that passenger. And so, you know, now, uh, that driver is only looking for the shorter ETAs, right? And so you can imagine that experience, you know, is now worse for the passenger. And it's kind of like a never ending cycle. I literally, you know, here in LA, right? Like imagine you're struggling to call a ride as a passenger. So now you call both Uber and Lyft, right? Because you can't get a ride and it's taking, this is literally in Los Angeles. I do this every day. Um, you know, I have to call both an Uber and Lyft. It might take five to 10 minutes to match with a driver who is then sometimes they're three minutes away. Sometimes they're 15 minutes away. Right. Um, and when they're three minutes away, it's almost sometimes like too fast, right? Because I called it like 20 minutes, you know, I I don't need it for 20 minutes because it's normally 15 or 20 minutes to get a ride. And so you can sort of see how like, you know, I wouldn't blame one side or the other, but there's all these like kind of back and forth uh, situations that like really start to deteriorate the marketplace. And it's funny because it also kind of is one of my number one uh, tips for new gig workers, whether you're doing ride share or delivery is to try these services from the platform. You may not need to order a ride or order food every day like I do. But, uh, you know, even at least once or twice, you really kind of start to see from the passenger's point of view and, you know, kind of really help inform and, you know, like going back to our running a good business discussion, you always kind of want to understand the customer's point of view and, you know, use the product from their point of view. So you can sort of see what's going on. Right. Exactly. Well, that, that, that brings up to me that, uh, passengers will, will passengers, want to keep doing this with right now, three times the rate canceled rides, yeah. UB drivers, hard to get a ride. Mm-hmm. I mean, are they going to get so turned off to all this? <clears throat> now I know the service yeah. is what it is. And once it snaps back a bit, people most likely will yeah. come back around, but I'm, I'm imagining that a lot of people are very up in arms right now. Yeah. Well, I think they are and, or not, I think they are. Um, let's, let's say it a little more <laughs> authority. The passengers are definitely pissed. You know, I think that reliability of Uber and Lyft is at an all time low, but frankly, this isn't happening in a bubble, right? Like I think a lot of people point to Uber and Lyft. Oh, it's so unreliable. I mean, restaurants are unreliable, you know what I mean? Like other industries, right. That are relying on service and frontline and even in the gig economy, you know, some are more unreliable right now. So 
it's not just Uber and Lyft. There's a larger, you know, kind of a macroeconomic labor shortage, you know, to put it in fancy terms. But I think that um, the the product itself, you know, like unfortunately, I think one of the challenges for drivers and gig workers is that there is such a low barrier to entry, which is great when you're just getting started, but it can lead to oversupply. And especially with rideshare, frankly, like getting someone from A to B, like I've talked about how hard this job is, right? But it's also not that hard when you think about it, right? Like you can screw up a bunch of turns, you can drive too fast, you can you know, do a lot of things wrong, <laughs> you can talk about all the wrong things, but at the end of the day, 99.99% of the time, you're still dropping your passenger off exactly where they wanna go. So they're get, you know, their experience may not be great, but what they're paying for is getting from A to B, right? And that part of the experience has really been commoditized and like, it's kind of dummy proof, right? Like no matter how bad of a driver you are, you know, even the worst drivers are still getting their passengers to where they want to go. Right. Whereas with food delivery, you know, if you screw a bunch of things up along the way, they get a cold order, right. Or they get the wrong meal, right. There's a lot actually that can go wrong there. And so I think that you know, going, going, I, I kind of forgot your original question before I went off on this tangent, but it just made me think of, you know, kind of, uh, on the, on the driver's side, right? Like, unfortunately, you know, for drivers, right? Like the being like a most amazing or best driver isn't always, you know, as valuable as you might hope. And I do think though, like on the oversupply issue, I do think that that has always been, you know, in the top three complaints of drivers and gig workers, it's like low pay, you know, commissions too high, unfair deactivations, oversupply of drivers, right? Because the companies, you know, they would rather have too many drivers than too few drivers for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think a lot of, or I know a lot of markets too are very small, Um, like a city like Denver, it's not quite LA, but it's pretty spread in in the way that LA is, you know, there's like 18 parts of downtown. Yeah. Um, A lot of cities just have eight blocks of downtown. Mm -hmm. So they're, they do a lot of short rides. I think one thing for sure is the longer the ride, um, the more it does matter your veteran status. Because if you're taking somebody 10 blocks down, yeah, you're getting a beta B. Mm-hmm. And they're getting out, but at the same time, you know, if, if I, a lot of times here in Denver, a short, we don't have a ton of short rides. Usually yeah. it's 20, 25 mm. minutes on average. So yeah. that's, you know, you either have well, to learn that your customer doesn't want to talk. Maybe they yeah. do try and read them. This is all part of being a service industry person. Yeah, You have to well, know and- how to read your, your, your room. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, no, I think that's a a key skill to understand. And I mean, I think that you definitely, um, you know, you kind of have to know how to read the passenger. (laughs) It's funny. I'm just thinking about all the rides I've had where, you know, the driver hasn't known how to read the passenger, but, uh, you know, and I kind of joke sometimes too, like, that's why I have a business is because most people don't know how to read the room. They don't know how to read the passenger. They don't know necessarily, um, you know, what they're doing, but yeah, definitely definitely important, you know, cause I've, I've always actually been whenever, whenever I see on social media, all the tip comments and stuff, I, mm-hmm. I've always been on the other side of that. Cause I worked for so many years in the, in the bar industry yeah. that I know how to, I, I mean, I'm only at, you know, when I used to do that, it was two thirteen an hour is what you made. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what a bartender makes yeah. because of tips. Right. And then we only claim our credit card tips, but wink, yeah. wink, nobody knows that, <laughs> you know, but I mean, like, that's how we get by. If you don't know how to make the tips, you're, you're missing a big part of the game. Yeah. And I know it's tough to get the ride share tips, but you got to work them. You got to try yeah. and get those tips. I mean, you just do because it, yeah, you know, you're going to make X amount, but you can make a lot more than X if you're not just so upset about making X. Yeah. Definitely agree. Because people can definitely read energy too. So your passenger is mm-hmm. going to read the energy in the car, even if you're not talking. Yeah. You know, they maybe you're not getting a tip because they they just don't like you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't I don't know I don't know how to put it any uh, more blatant than that. But uh, um, before, bef- so I don't know if it's I don't know if it's smaller companies maybe have it in now too or a better chance. I know that that's just been so hard for the smaller companies. Yeah, no, I think that was, yeah, that was the one thing, uh, you know, I wanted to 
chime in before we wrap up here. I mean, I, I guess as far, you know, I started talking about as far as, you know, what the other options are, um, you know, I mean, and like even other companies, I mean, I do, I do think that, you know, Uber and Lyft are kind of the big boys. I mean, you're thinking about like other rideshare companies, you know, how they might uh, yeah, yeah. fit in. Yeah. Like some of the startups, not like Alto who's now, you know, who's paying their to be employees, but like more yeah. like the ones I can't remember what, that started in Austin it actually looked like it had a good little run. Mm. And then there's a bunch of other ones popping up. Yeah. Too, I mean, I think there's a couple lately, you know, I, I guess I will not to dismiss them, but I think there's always sort of a flavor of the month, you know, when it comes to new rideshare companies right now, I think we just posted about one starting in Hawaii called Hulolo, I think is what it's called. And then there's one that got a little bit of press in the past few weeks called Drivers Cooperative that's in New York. And I think the issue, um, well, I mean, I guess what I would say is that like, I'm a big fan of all of these companies. I think that, you know, the more competition there is out there, the better. And, you know, Uber and Lyft do, especially Uber has a very dominant position in the rideshare market specifically. And I think that, you know, more competitors is a good thing. You know, we saw Juno was probably the, you know, the only real threat we've seen pop up in the past five, six, seven, or not five, six, you know, past five, six years. And that didn't go end up going too great for drivers. We've got a, I've got a podcast all about what went wrong if anyone's interested there but it's like an hour discussion and then um you know there is via there's sort of an alternative there's via and alto but i think you're thinking more of the new ones and i think the challenge is that we know there's a lot of issues on the driver's side right like it's not hard to launch a new company and i always get people emailing me saying hey you know i've got a great idea for a company or hey you should start your own company i'm like oh my god that's the last thing i want to do <laughs> really right. tough really expensive and really challenging and i think that there are a lot of issues you can address on the supply side. So that's drivers, you know, find a way to pay them better, you know, lower commissions or at least more reasonable commissions, you know, no more unfair deactivations, better support, you know, no uh, oversupply of drivers, like those five things, boom, if you told every right. driver that it's like slam dunk, right? They'll sign up for you right then and there. But with the caveat that they need to make money, they need rides. And I think that's what's challenging right now, um, or less challenging right now in the pandemic. But, you know, Uber, the product, you know, from a rider's perspective has always worked so well. And so I think unless you have a way that you're going to attract customers over that, you know, you can't just charge cheaper than Uber, right? Like Uber has, you know, we talked earlier about its cost, right? Like they've got, you can't like find, get a better deal on insurance than Uber has. They're doing millions of rides a day at scale. How are you going to get a better deal there? Right? Like right. there's certain areas, right? But structurally you have to find a way that you're going to outperform the product. Right. And so I think that's what makes it so tough is that it's hard to compete with Uber and really, you know, make, you could say, okay, and this is what Juno did. They said, okay, our rides are going to be cheap cheaper. And then over time, of course, you know, as they got bigger, they can't be 15% cheaper than Uber forever. And so they started raising their prices. Boop customers started going back over to Uber. And that's why I think right now is a really interesting time because the service, the rideshare services right now, freaking suck, right? As we talked about, right? Reliability is super low. Prices are super high. And so I guess what I'm saying is if I was going to launch a company or if a company did have a shot and even a small shot, like right now is the time where you can really start attacking like, Hey, what are all, you know, you know, you still might experience some of the same issues with driver shortages and things like that. But like, Hey, maybe now's the time where you really do go and take a bunch of those most loyal Uber and Lyft drivers. And maybe now is the time where like, they're willing to actually give up. Up, you know, they're making a bunch of money and they're willing to actually give up a few trips here and there to say, Hey, you know what? I believe in this new company. I'm going to follow through. And so I do think that there's some interesting opportunity right now. I will be honest. I haven't seen, you know, there's no company like out there that I'm like, Oh my God, I'm so excited to talk to them and cover them because I think they're going to be the ones to do it. But, uh, right. you know, I, I think if, if someone was going to make it happen, uh, now's the time. Well, I think that we had a couple others too, like uh, trip rides, it was like more of a pyramid thing. And that really brought yeah. some bad PR to the smaller companies. But one thing I do want to get you. Although if people is, did read uh, my site, I think the first and only thing we ever published about them was basically asking if they were a scam. So that, that is a good point <laughs> though. Um, like some, you know, it's easy yeah. to put up a landing page, right? It's easy to talk about all the things that suck for drivers and to get people to sign up for an email list. And so the things that I and look for. Data far, and then their data for me. Yeah. And so the things that I look for, just because I think this is important, we've got an article on my site about how to start a rideshare company. I always ask when people present me with a new 
company, do you have a functioning driver and rider app? Because that's expensive. Do you have commercial insurance, right? Because you need to insure drivers um, when they're on trips. And then third, uh, are you approved by the local utility? So like here in California, it would be the California Public uh, Public Utilities Commission, where you would literally like, I should be able to go onto their website, look up your company, you know, Stephen Johnson rides, you've got a permit. Okay. And then at that point, and I will say 95% of the companies that come to me don't have all three of those things. But what about like Ola and DD? I mean, they've, they've put their footmark into the United States now. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the international competitors are still maybe a little ways off. I think that, you know, Didi just filed to go public, like they're looking at $100 billion. And it's kind of funny because Uber owns 12.8% of them. So they're going to get like close to $12 billion when they go public. So one of Uber's better investments, uh, giving up in China. But I think that um, there, I, I feel like that could be less of a near term threat and maybe more of like a midterm threat. And I guess in the near term, it does seem like there's a lot more competition in the food delivery space. Like I could see Ola and Didi and some of these other companies clashing with Uber and food delivery. But I think on the rides piece, uh, I just don't know if those companies are itching to, you know, kind of try and come in and compete with Uber in the U.S. market. Really? Hmm. I, I, I just wonder because I, it feels like they've been coming in for a while. And I feel like lately I've been reading more and more and more that, you know, they're here now. They're here. And I know they've been here for a while, but I feel like they're here wanting to, to do business. They're not just Um, here because they're here. (laughs) Maybe, maybe I haven't really seen them making too much headway myself personally on the ride side, but you know, again, right. Like if, if, you know, if, if I'm DD right now, those would be big right now, right. Those would be, and those would be kind of the companies, you know? And so I guess that's really to put a button on my point is I think it's gonna be tough for anyone small to medium to compete with uh, Uber and Lyft at scale. But I do think, you know, maybe some of these bigger companies, Excuse me. Maybe some of these uh, big, bigger companies might have, uh, you know, might might be having a chance, or you know, they might be thinking about it. But I, I don't think anyone's made, you know, a bit. I mean, I know no company has made a big announcement or big push, right? They haven't launched in L.A. You know, Didi hasn't launched in L.A., San Francisco, right, yeah. Chicago, New York. Those would be kind of like the announcements that would tell me, like, whoa, these guys right, are for yeah. real. Yeah. Well, um, I'm not going to keep you any longer, and I really appreciate you coming on because uh, I know you got commotion in Miami this week, right? Yeah, I'm headed to uh, Miami for my first uh, in-person conference on Wednesday, so that should be fun. I'm moderating a panel all about uh, the curb, and so sort of like the, uh, you know, the curb space, and actually, you know, so a lot of like food delivery and, you know, restaurants, takeouts, pick up and drop off for Uber and Lyft drivers, so there's a lot going on at the curb, and, uh, you know, that's sort of like one of the things I like focusing on these days, not the curb itself, but, you know, just sort of like how rideshare interacts with a lot of these other areas, you know, like rideshare and food delivery, rideshare and, you know, um, the curb, for example, or AVs, whatever it might be. So lots of, lots of stuff happening. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah. Um, and everybody, if you don't know Harry, I'd be shocked because, uh, <laughs> he's been around for since before me and anybody else I know. So if, if you haven't heard of him, it must be your first day driving or something. And, uh, you know, oh, I'm sure there's still plenty. And, yeah, I'm, I appreciate that. I don't I'm know. sure there's still I, I some, think that some. Most people, <laughs> most people I run into know of your name, you know, or, you know, I don't know. It's it's yeah. pretty common. If you YouTube something on Rideshare, you've been around longer than everybody else. So, I mean, like, you're going to see you come up. Yeah, that is uh, you know, one so. of my goals is sort of be like a cockroach, <laughs> never die everywhere. You type something related to Rideshare, Uber, you yeah. know, even some food delivery topics into a box on the internet. And hopefully I, if I pop up, I'm doing my job. Yep, but I got my hat here. And, uh... Oh, nice. Looking good. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for that. And, uh, Harry, thank you for coming on. I, uh, you know, I think that, I think that a lot of people are concerned. I think that a lot of people are, are wondering what's going to happen with rideshare. And I think that, I think some things do need to happen. I do think that for, to, to maintain good drivers, something's going to need to change if they just want to keep onboarding and going through. And that's a, being a business owner myself for many different times in my lifetime, I know that, you know, overhead of employees is what can kill you quick. Yeah. 
So, I mean, losing people in a week or a week or a week, like yeah. it might seem like it works, but over time, you're better if people are connecting and liking yep. it. And that's why the, also why the independent contractor model is so powerful for the companies, yeah. but we'll, uh, we'll see. Thanks, Steve. Yeah. Thanks, Harry. <laughs>